for the second day of Youth in High Dimensions. Hello in Bar, <laughs> and welcome. Uh, so let's start the session with a, a talk on stochastic optimization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and for this great workshop. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, recent work. This is, uh, I would say that this is a joint work with a group of great researchers from uh, McGill University, uh, Liz B. Biconia and Andrew Courtney that will present in the afternoon about scaling law, so stay tuned, and Elliot. Um, hmm? Better? OK. Um, so I will, I, I will give now the kind of uh, introduction to the story. So the idea is that. Uh, we are looking at stochastic uh, algorithm, and what we find is that in high dimension, they converge to a deterministic uh, limit. And we see that for many algorithms, which allows us to also provide uh, analysis, typical behavior analysis and a lot of interesting uh, phenomena that we can understand now. All right. So as any machine learning problem uh, nowadays, um, so you start with like some and samples that are drawn from some unknown distribution and typically what you will do is to do averaging over in order to kind of do your task you will need to do some averaging empirical average empiric, uh, on, on, on your uh, cost function but actually what you would be very much interesting is to is to do to understand what is the population error so this is a quantity that is not known so this I'm not uh, saying anything uh, new here. So, so what, what is the problem in high dimension? So in high dimension, the main issue is that both the number of parameters but also the number of samples is very large. And this is motivated by also state-of-the-art algorithm that contains now billions, if not trillions, of, of parameters as, as well as number of samples. And you can roughly say that number of parameters and number of samples is kind of, of the same um, order. So you would think that if you take an infinite number of samples, you would converge to the population error, but in high dimension, this is not uh, quite clear. So this is, I guess, why we all here um, in this type of workshop. Um, so what I'm going to show today is that um, we, are, we are able to provide a theory that gives you an exact prediction uh, of the error. Um, and using this theory, um, I, I will present how, how is this applied to many examples? Um, and what we can do now is to kind of understand what learning rate will actually ensure that we will be stable uh, during the optimization algorithm. And the other question that uh, I, will, I will answer is what, what learning rate and re how do the learning rate and the risk behave in, in high dimension? And, uh, how, and, and and how is this actually depend on the structure of the data? So this is kind of, and you will see that the, the, the behavior is very much dependent on, on how, how the data is structured. Uh, so kind of the workhorse of what uh, I will be talking about, the, the main algorithm will be uh, one, one pass uh, single batch uh, SGD. Though some of my, the, the idea that I will be talking about uh, can be extended to, to uh, multi-pass. Multi um, and so the idea with this type of algorithm, for, for those who don't know, so, so, as you, so at each iteration I'm taking a new example, and, and uh, if I will take enough example, in the end of the day I will converge, I, I will converge to, the, to the, I will have a good estimate of the full gradient. And we will be working in this high dimensional limit or thermodynamic limit in which the number of samples and the number of parameters are kind of of the same um, order. So this is, was also mentioned yesterday in the, talk, in the talk by Ludwig. He also uh, analyzed some of his results on this uh, type of algorithm. So maybe one, one thing to say about SGD with fixed dimension compared to infinite uh, parameters. Uh, so the theory for SGD is like quite old. It goes back to the 50s. Um, and so for finite dimension, we, are, we kind of understand uh, almost most of the things. Um, so it is well known that if you take the learning rate uh, to zero, then uh, you have a low large number and you converge to essentially gradient flow, which is great because that actually means that when you do the minimization, you're actually converging 
um, to, the true, uh, to the true population. But what happened in high dimension, and this is kind of what taking learning rate to zero is not something that is, you, you can actually do, because if you even try to calculate gradient for trillions of parameters, that takes a lot of time. Uh, so what people typically do in practice, they consider constant uh, step size. Uh, and, and, and in that situation, the number of parameters, and this is what I will consider, is of the order of the number of samples. Okay, and, in, and here it's not clear whether we converge the population mass. So I cannot answer all this in very uh, generality, in, in full generality, so I will, I will focus on a particular model that will kind of capture a lot of the phenomena. And similar model was also considered yesterday uh, by Ludwig. Um, so the idea here is that I'm thinking about the teacher-student model, which is kind of well known in, in, the, in the statistical physics community. Um, so what, what I'm doing here com compared to the traditional one is that I will assume that the, um, uh, that the features does have some um, non-trivial covariance metrics. And this, as you will see, will change a lot, uh, both in the dynamics and, and, and also in the way this algorithm uh, converge, uh, the way they converge. Uh, so kind of the main idea is that I have a set of parameters, X star, that the teacher generates, uh, which have some low dimensionality, meaning that there is some low dimension L star that is much smaller than D, so effectively total number of parameters is D. Uh, and I'm applying some function of this low dimension projection of my uh, input and I can add the noise the way I, I want to. So this is the setting of the generation of the data. So I, I, bear with me on this because I will use this uh, extensively during the talk. Um, and now the student, for the student, we um, given the data, so, it, so the, the student tries to find a map between AI and YI. So you kind of have the hunch that the teacher essentially uh, did also um, low dimensional projection, so she tries to do the same. And so in this situation, it's also that she has a matrix X, but also with one, uh, one um, dimension that is, that is uh, small. And this structure also includes some um, very, very uh, uh, silly neural networks of, of, of this form. Um, Okay, and one of the nice parts about uh, this model is that if you look at the population error, you will see that everything is actually uh, dependent on this low dimensional projection, both of the teacher oops, and the student. So, so let's start with like what happened. So up to here, my setting is clear. So let me start with what happened when there is no structure. So we are talking about the case of, um, of K that is, it is, uh, that is isotropic. So because of the form of this model, which is also known as the general linear model, um, then, then you have this, the, the, the iterate look in this form. Um, and, and what you, you find and is, and this is not new, that actually in order to understand the dynamics, you need to track only two uh, order parameters, one of them is the, is the norm of your iterate, and the other one is the overlap uh, with, with the truth. So once you have, once you understand the equation for this object, you can actually infer almost any function that you want of the dynamics. And so the first, so, so what, what you can show is that actually these objects satisfy an OD. Uh, if, and here I arrange them in a matrix form, but the, the idea is that you need to track this object. Um, and, and so the, the only thing that you need to do is to change times to time. So essentially, you need to think about each iteration of HUD as T times D in, the, in this new OD. And the idea is that you take um, continuum time by taking D to infinity instead of uh, uh, the learning rate to zero. So this is just to, to to kind of show you what, what is the ODE. So the ODE is that first you have a, a first term that is the gradient term, and this goes like in a minus direction, but then you have another term, which is a noise term, 
And if it goes in the plus direction, which actually shows you that in, sometimes in, is that in high dimension, actually, the, the discretization and the stochasticity actually sometimes can hurt you. And this is, can move you out of the stability uh, region. OK. Um, so this is not new, the fair, the, what happened in the, um, in the no structure uh, case. Uh, and there is many, um, many results about this going back already uh, to the 90s. Um, and, and, and great results that came afterwards, including, including the one by Sebastian here about the two-layer neural network. Um, so, so in, but when there is a structure, then there is much less results. So in the, for linear regression, um, there are some also there are some results that also showed it for multipath HDD by my collaborators, um, and for um, for the two-layer neural network again there is a result a nice result by Sebastian about uh, the, the manifold learning. Um, so so but but all this is still is still there is no there is not there is much less result about uh, what happened when you have a structure um, in your data. So why is it actually so, so why there is not, not that much results? What is so hard about this case? Uh, so the main kind of issue here is that if you try to do, uh, to write this autonomous set of equation that I had before, so what happens here is that you, you essentially the system doesn't close. And the reason why the system doesn't close is that you will start to have higher order terms that will contain powers and, and higher powers um, of k. So kind of thinking from the point of view of, of, uh, of random matrix theory, the, the, the easiest way to deal with this type of problem is to use resolvents. Um, and this is just a matter of like was a kind of a tool in, in our proof. Um, but the idea is that if the, the resolvent is a nice tool because if you take metrics and apply and, and multiply it with the resolvent, you get back the resolvent and you can expand it um, to any power. And this is why I can also write any power of k uh, using this uh, object by just doing a, a integration on the complex plane of all eigenvalues and it encompasses all eigenvalues. So why is this helping me? Um, because now I can define new type of order parameters. So the, the new type of order parameters that uh, I will define is, is essentially with the, metri with, with, with the, the norm that, in, that inside contains the metric that is the resolvent. And the same thing for the overlap. Um, and if I do that, so let me just arrange it in a nice uh, matrix form, uh, then we can show the same uh, kind of uh, concentration. And in, in, in particular, now you can show that you still have um, ODE that you can track, and the system does close. So this is, this is um, and, it, and this is very useful, because now, again, I can use this uh, resolvent form to represent any function um, that I want and track uh, the dynamics. Um, and so if you don't like this representation in terms of the resolvent and also um, we also have another representation in terms of an SD. Um, so, so, in, so the idea is first follow, we, we, you, you want to think about another process that will be as close as possible to this, um, to this SGD. But it's a, cl a close in what sense? So the process we find is, is the following process. So this is a, a stochastic differential uh, equation. So the first term in the, like the drift term is exactly what you would expect. It's what comes from gradient flow. But the second term is, is a term that includes essentially um, the noise that, that is created by the discretization. And you can see here why I had a problem with, uh, with, the, with the covariant, non-trivial covariance matrix, because it answers inside the noise. So it does, it, it enter in, in a non, in, in kind of a um, non-trivial non way. So this, so this matrix, we call it the Fisher matrix and it comes from uh, the, the, uh, the analog in statistics. Um, and, and the same for, for this process, the, the same idea follows. So you take the, 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 the time scale is again 
uh, t times d in, in the original uh, process. Um, and now we can, sh we can prove that for large set of statistics, actually infinite one, um, you do have convergence over this process. So this is, um, so this is maybe a, a little bit more on the theory side, but um, got just one thing to say is that essentially uh, the, this convergence is not of the process itself, but actually on this set of function. And that kind of led me back to what was my first question, so what will be the limiting equation? So in a way, you could say that this is, uh, so this, this is in, uh, represented by this type of process or the OD. Uh, but the idea is that it's only on set of functions, so only on large set of statistics, or uh, infinite one actually in our case here, that, that you have this uh, convergence. And, and, so, and, and this function can be the loss function or any other uh, quantities. So up to you, it was very um, theoretical, and maybe let's let's see how does it work in part, in some examples. And I will start with a very basic one and build uh, uh, more right af afterwards. So let me start with a really really basic one. I know everyone wants to analyze a neural network, but let's start with the linear regression first to understand. Um, so here, my data is generated with with a set of uh, with just a, a linear projection. Um, and I can simply write um, the loss function um, in, 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 that, uh, in that form. And so if I apply the theorem, uh, we can find an equation for the loss function. Then the equation for the loss function fo follows this linear response um, and behavior, also known as Volterra integral equation. Um, and this function here, we are explicit. We know what they are. And they are essentially... Um, depending only on, on the discrepancy at initialization, x0 minus x star, and on the matrix, uh, the covariance matrix of my data, um, k. Okay, so we understood uh, the linear case. So now let me analyze an example in which um, you have non-square loss. So this is the multi, uh, for example, multi-class logis logistic regression. So still in the, in the convex domain, but, but something that uh, we can track. Uh, so in that case, um, the, the problem is that you have a set of examples and you want to classify them into three classes. So given your, 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 your lab, uh, AI and YI will be uh, the probability of each, uh, each example to be related to one class. Uh, so I guess most of you are familiar with this. So what you would do is to minimize the cross um, entropy uh, loss. And this is essentially the example that I've shown at the beginning that uh, we, for, for example, for the case of binary logistic regression, we can really track the dynamics. And you can see that the theory uh, converging to the, to the dynamics of SGD as a dimension um, grow. And, uh, and now to a more um, in kind of interesting example, the non-convex example. So this is uh, maybe the, the, the canonical example that, that theoreticians use if they want to, uh, to study what happened in the non-convex case. So here I took it for the, 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 so the idea of this problem is it comes from um, optics when you have measurements of the Fourier transform of an image, but you want to recover the face. Um, so this can be, uh, can be uh, modeled as absolute, if you have absolute value of my projection, it can also be um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the second moment of this, and it will be the similar uh, behavior. Um, and so what is the issue with this type of problem when you are in the non-convex plane, and that was uh, that uh, domain, and that was also mentioned uh, yesterday, is the initialization. So the main issue is that if you start from a random um, initialization, then if I thinking, I'm thinking about what will be my overlap with, with the truth, if I just start from random initialization, that will be one over um, square root of the dimension. So that's, that, so that's very tiny in high dimension, right? So, so then you can show that if you start with, with, with this type of overlap, then uh, you will, it will take you uh, D log D iteration. Uh, so this is essentially the sample complexity of this problem. So this was already uh, uh, proven, and you can also show, uh, see it from a very uh, simple argument. 
just in, the, in terms of intuition. Um, and and for um, but but most what most work does is that they start with some kind of like non-zero overlap, so some order one overlap. It's supposedly that you have some knowledge about the direction of x star, and in that case you can show that the number of samples will be of order uh, the, of the dimension, and we can actually see that exactly uh, from our ODE. So what we what I plotted here. Is the, the, is the overlap between um, my, my, uh, the parameters and x star as a function of the ratio between, uh, uh, of the norms. And what you see is that the behavior really changes as a function of the learning rate. So if you start uh, with a very large learning rate, so you will reach pretty fast um, uh, to, the, to the optimum. But as you take the learning rate to be uh, smaller and smaller, which correspond to something that will be more uh, closer to, to gradient flow, it takes you much, much more time. So at the end, you, until you develop this uh, non-zero overlap, and once you develop it, um, you, you, can, you can develop also uh, the norm. And, and similar um, effect can also be seen um, if you look at the, um, at the loss function. So this is, a, again, as a function of the learning rate. So you see that you have this uh, plateau. Uh, if you are, if that, that it takes you some time to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to go out of there. And as your learning rate is higher, then that becomes easier. So this is an example in which learning rate does um, help, that is in which um, high dimension, being in high dimension, and the noise is actually does help you. Okay, so now I promised that um, I can show something also about um, what will be uh, the learning rate that will ensure that we actually uh, converge. Um, so, so essentially, what you would like to analyze here is some kind of Lyapunov function that you can track. So, one function to, uh, that maybe you analyze a lot by also the optimization optimizer is that if you look at the distance to optimality. Um, and you can show that this is actually converged to a, um, a deterministic limit using our theorem. And then you can derive a simple, again, equation for this distance. Um, as a fun I mean, these functions are also explicit, and we can also uh, calculate them. And uh, what, uh, again, now just you have one negative term and one positive term, and you want to that this ODE will be stable, so you have some dynamical threshold that kind of control the stability of this OD. And kind of, um, and if you assume some sort of smoothness and, uh, and lifelessness on, on, your, on your gradient, then you can show that actually um, this, is, uh, this, this is actually a, a, a constant. Um, but what you see here is that, is that essentially this uh, threshold depend on the average eigenvalue. So it means that if you are thinking about the typical behavior in high dimension, it, it's actually you can arrive to a much larger learning rate and will still be, and still be stable compared to what people would, would think for, for the finite theory, which then the, 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 the threshold would depend on the uh, largest uh, eigenvalue. Yes. Oh, <laughs> K is the covariance matrix of my data. I'm sorry, I was uh, I was passing that maybe too fast. Um, so this is a this is quite important uh, point. Um, thank you for the question. Um, okay, so and you can show also similar uh, convergence uh, rate result uh, that tells you that it also the. Um, it goes like the minimal eigenvalue divided by the average eigenvalue. So it's, it's really about uh, this average condition number that controlled uh, the behavior. And, and so, and maybe kind of like from what I'm going to talk uh, later, you note know here that there is some this dynamical threshold. And this is also motivate algorithm, which will not look about constant step size, but also an adaptive one. And this is, will be the second part uh, that I will talk about. Uh, so you would think about an algorithm in which at each iteration you want to minimize 
uh, say the distance optimality or the loss function itself. And to maximize, sorry, the, the descent of this uh, object. Okay, and what uh, you see here, so this is just to validate our theory. So here is some numerical simulation. So what uh, we look at now is the distance optimality at the last uh, iterate as a function of the learning rate. And what we played here was with different uh, covariance matrix structure. So they all have some power of structure, but the power is different. And what we kept constant for all of them was the average eigenvalue. And what you could see, what you see here is that they all uh, kind of collapse on the same point. So this is the, the threshold of stability. So at this point, you see that, that indeed uh, all, all of them, you're, you're, you're escaping the stability. So this is exactly um, predicted by our theory. Uh, but if you want to look at the convergence rate of, these, of each one of these um, um, uh, it was one of these uh, lines, you, you, it does depend on the maximum and uh, minimum eigenvalue. Okay, so up to here, any more questions? So I will move to um, the second part, which is about um, adaptive stochastic uh, algorithms. So it turns out that we can apply uh, the same, and maybe that will be also more application of the theory, that we can apply similar theory to that case. So what is the motivation here? So the motivation here is that, as I showed you here, is that typically you don't have this knowledge of, of like how to choose the best step size. And in most cases, uh, this is a problem for a practitioner. So what typically people do is that um, they try to learn the, the optimal step size. So, so, and they do it in a some, somewhat adaptive uh, manner. So this is vastly used in practice and actually more than, than stochastic gradient descent. And the examples for that is algorithm known as Adegrad, Line Search, uh, Adam, RMS Porp. There is also a new one which is called the Adaptation, Dog, and, and many, many more. And maybe even while I'm speaking, there are people inventing more and more algorithms of this type. Um, and so what is the difficulty for a, for a theorist in order to analyze this type of algorithm in this stochastic domain? So if you're talking about stochastic gradient descent. So the main idea is that now, the main problem is that now the system becomes non-Markovian. So in a way, what is happening is that you, you have each step is now depend, the, the step size is now a stochastic process that depend on all the history and all the gradient uh, and the gradient of the of the um, of of what you had at at, the, at um, starting from, from when, when you run the process. Um, so this is this is quite become so so this has become quite hard to track. But it turns out that using our framework, we can actually uh, derive again a deterministic uh, limit. And, and track uh, the dynamics uh, in this uh, case. Okay, and, and so let me uh, start with this algorithm that is some simple, simple idea. So this, the simplest idea would be uh, given, this, uh, given the ODs that I had before, maybe what I want to do is kind of at each iteration to kind of um, take a step that will maximize um, the risk. Um, and so what we find that if you do that, um, you are actually, the, the, the learning rate will be, be, will be lower bounded by, again, the minimal eigenvalue divided now by, by trace of k squared. Um, and and so we also have explicit formula for what will be the learning rate, the asymptotic learning rate. But then, but then if you compare it to what I've shown you for SGD, which was one over squ uh, square root of, of, of k, uh, of, the, of the average eigenvalue. So in high dimension, actually, if you have like large anisotropy, this is a problem because that will mean that choosing this type of greedy algorithm will actually be very bad for you because it will it kind of push you to, to do like very, very uh, small step size. Okay, so this is, this is like a, a first example. And another type of algorithm that uh, uh, we can analyze is something that is known as adequate norm. 
So this is the form of the algorithm. Uh, and, and, what, and what you find um, here and, uh, is that, um, so, the, so the idea is that you're taking uh, the history of the whole of your gradient and using this, you're calculating the gradient in a new step. And B0 is some parameter and gamma, and gamma are parameters that you take at, in, to, at initialization, you, you choose them. But, but they, it, supposedly, they're supposed not to, not to be so much critical in terms of choice. But we will see uh, how does that uh, behave. Um, and so what we find is that you, the ODE that I've shown yeah, before was actually applied only with this dynamical uh, learning rate. But now you, you also have an equation for the learning rate itself. OK. And, and here I'm, I'm limiting myself to the case in which um, this LN and star that I've shown before, everything is vectors here, just to uh, simplify the situation. And so, for example, for the linear uh, least square problem that I've shown before, so this, uh, this, the, this, this function here can be simplified to be the loss. So the learning rate really depends on the integral of the loss. Um, so that's kind of what this algorithm uh, does. And, and this is an example of our theory, how it works for, um, ha, uh, for, for, um, for the adequate norm case. So this is the least squares, and, and you can see the learning rate and the risk. Um, and you can see that we really are able to, to track the dynamic, this, and we also do it for uh, the nonlinear case, for the logistic regression, you can see the same thing. So we actually, the, the equation does, uh, are able to track um, the dynamics. Um, okay, so, but, but, so this, is, this is very nice, but maybe we can say something more qualitative on what happened um, in the, uh, uh, at least for the linear case, uh, it, because it seems that even for the linear case, this is not so easy to understand the dynamics of what Adegrad is actually doing. So if you recall, I've shown you that if you're looking at a constant step size, uh, then for the, linear, for, the, for the linear case, when you are looking at linear regression, uh, then the dynamics of the loss follow this, um, this, very linear, uh, this linear response uh, equation. So what we find now is that similar thing will apply for the other grant, for the, for the adaptive uh, step size with, with a slightly different um, behavior here, but, but still something that we are able to track and, and, and understand. Um, and what I will show that by studying this kind of system, you can, we, can, we can see different type of behavior as a function of the structure of the covariance metrics. And so, and one thing to show, to say is that if, and why do I focus on the case of no noise? Because if you do have noise, then immediately you see that the learning rate, and that if you, that the learning rate will actually converge to one over square root of t. So in, that will be the, the fastest convergence of the learning rate. So it will converge to zero. But it turns out that if you don't have noise, noise, and if you look at the structure of the covariance k, in some situation, you will actually converge to a constant step size. So this is what happens if you are, you are in the strongly convex case, but also even if you have just number, finite number of, of zero eigenvalues. So even in that case, um, the learning rate will converge to a constant. But when then we find out that if we take some power law behavior of the spectrum, uh, then you have like very rich behavior of what we happen to the risk and to the, um, and to, uh, the learning rate. Um, okay, and maybe a little bit about what is the actually asymptotic learning rate that you converge to. Uh, so what you see here is that we plot essentially uh, HDD as a function of different value of the initial distance to optimality. And indeed, you see that there is uh, differences between uh, the lines. And this is exactly, and this formula is actually what we are able to, um, to find. And, and so it really shows how, how this depends on the distance of optimality. So it kind of tells you that, and it actually doesn't depend on other things. So if you look at kind of the condition number of, the, of my covariance matrix, 
then um, you see that, it, that the asymptotic value doesn't depend on it. So it's really about the, the distance to optimality. And, and so it kind of tells you that if you would have known the distance to optimality, which is a problem, and this is why people are not so happy with other grad and they want uh, other algorithm because you don't know a priori this distance to optimality. So then you, if, if you would have known, then, then you could have know what, where do you converge to. Um, and, and other type of algorithm that try to kind of go beyond this and, and, and to, uh, is, is something that is called the adaptation and DOG. And this can also be analyzed uh, using uh, our method. Um, and maybe last, last thing about what happens when you do have a lot of zero eigenvalues. So you're, you're not in the strongly convex case. So what we find is this really rich behavior. So we do like two answers. So we assume that uh, the, the spectrum behave like a power law. Um, and so you have, so, and that you have some sort of like localization of the, of the eigenvalues. So if I project the x0 minus x star on the eigenvalues of the matrix k, then, then I have this uh, uh, localization. And so if delta is equal to zero, then that means that if it, it's like if you would take um, X zero that we have like um, the isotropically, but as, as, as delta, delta is larger, then you have like larger anisotropy. Um, and this type of assumption is kind of uh, uh, widely used. Um, and what we find is that depending on beta and delta, uh, you find different behavior. So if beta and delta are very small, so you have like small anisotropy, and so, so they are not, the eigenvalues are, uh, they are not so localized. Um, then the learning rate converges to a constant. But then the risk has this, again, power law behavior. And then, uh, but if this is larger than that, then both of them converge um, uh, to, to zero, but they have a different power. And we can actually see that also um, in simulation. So you see exactly that there is this transition um, in the behavior. And it kind of also suggests that, that maybe the scaling laws of the loss also depend on which algorithm you're actually uh, taking. So that also affects uh, uh, the behavior uh, of, of, the, of the loss as a function of the iteration. Um, so maybe to conclude, uh, what, what uh, I've shown you was, was, uh, is that I started with this um, exact asymptotic theory for SGD and SGD with adaptive uh, uh, learning rate. So are we really able to track the dynamics and, ex and, and get exactly what will be uh, the behavior. Um, and, and using this type of idea, we are able to analyze stochastic algorithm, which is something that before it was quite hard to do, but now when you have this deterministic an analog, you can, you can analyze them. And, and we do find how the learning rate is behaving and maybe threshold on the learning as, as a function of the structure of the data. Um, and, and so we do see that for the case of, of this adaptive method that, that anisotropy is, anisotropic in covariance does, does change a lot. And for example, for this uh, very simple ideal situation that I've shown for the line search. Um, and we do see that, for example, al algorithm like Aragonom, it's really, we, we, we see that if you would have had some knowledge about what is the distance optimality at initialization, some kind of warm um, start, then they would have, you, you could have chosen your step size smartly, but you don't know that. So there is something missing in order to really understand how algorithms such as Adam or, or or, uh, or other approach that, that, that does seem to, to do better. So, so there's still a question here of how do we, um, how do we kind of go around this uh, um, and can we understand what other algorithms uh, do? Um, and so, and, and I've shown you that the reason this algorithm uh, dependent uh, scaling law uh, and this phase transition that we found as a function um, of the structure. Um, and, and, and I would say that this is applied to other type of, uh, of this uh, adaptive uh, method. That, for example, RMSPARP has this uh, 
weighting on, on the amount of memory that you keep from the previous gradient. So this is other algorithm that we don't really understand exactly when do they work and when do they don't, especially in high dimension. And maybe one thing that I, since I'm here and I will be happy to talk about uh, offline um, is, is uh, maybe how we, here we are looked at a very simple model and, and a dynamical theory. But we have a theory for what happened for, in the Bayesian case for, inf for, for the case of um, deep neural networks. Um, and so is there a way to kind of understand the connection between equilibrium and non-equilibrium behavior? Um, and how oh, oh, everything I've shown here can be kind of translated to understand uh, deeper architecture and architecture that people are actually using in practice. Uh, and, and also other phase transition that we find in the tactics, how are these um, connected um, to, um, to, to f dynamical phase transition uh, that we see uh, in the dynamics. Okay, so with that, thank you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much for this very exciting talk. Are there questions in the audience? Um, thanks, uh, thanks again for the talk. Um, so you, you showed this uh, nice phase transition and these nice behaviors as a function of the spectrum of the covariance. Um, have you tried like, to validate this on real data? Like if you take a bunch of uh, generalized linear models from data sets, because then you can compute the spectrum empirically and you can try to see if the power laws are indeed yes. appearing also there. Yes, so we have um, actually, I mean, we have some, some results on that uh, too. It's very initialized yet, but we do have some results that indicate that at least for the linear case, the theory does apply. Yes, that, that's at least for, like, say, that is at like CIFAR. Or... Thanks. Um, for the last uh, slide of your contents, the way you showed like the projections on the eigen spectrum, um, what is uh, like I, I didn't really understand what uh, what were the order parameters you would have to track there. You mean uh... like just a question? Can you comment on that? Which slide? Uh... Um, before the conclusion. This slide. Yep, this slide. Okay, what are the so, order parameters of the system there? So this is um, still the linear case. Um, but um, for the linear case, actually, um, it's enough to, to kind of track uh, the distance to, to, to optimality and modes of the distance to optimality. Um, uh, but all the other parameters that I, I've shown are actually kind of simplifying this situation because um, it's just the norm of my iterate and the overlap. And all this can be used to, to write exactly what will be okay. the loss. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a silly question on your optimal condition for the learning rate. So can you give a little bit more intuition? Because to me, if we are larger than uh, one over the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix, I feel like something is going to go wrong on that axis. So can you give some, some more intuition to grasp these uh, D over the trace of the covariance? OK, so first of all, no silly questions. <laughs> Second, um, um, I, I, th I think that it really depends. So this is a setting of high dimension. So we are working in the, we're looking at this typical behavior, and the main point is really that you can push the learning rate beyond just something that would be one over the largest eigenvalue, but you can actually get get still stable system uh, for learning rate that goes like one over the, the average eigenvalue. So so I I don't know what is the setting that you you have tried. Um, I, I've showed it for like an ideal situation, but I, I, I think that in some cases that can be extended. So is it possible that maybe in this case, stable system doesn't necessarily mean that we converge on the 
one single dimension associated so, with the largest eigenvalue. So there is a difference between what will be uh, the learning rate that will ensure convergence uh, to the true, uh, to the true minimum, and, and the learning rate that will just ensure stability. So they are not always the same thing. I see, I see. And maybe one more question. So uh, related to the very last slide on uh, deep neural networks. So given the framework you're building, are these considerations on, let's say, learning rate helping you to do more efficient hyperparameter search, even so, for deep networks? So that's, that would be very interesting <laughs> to understand that I don't know. What we did analyze here is really a Bayesian framework. So we looked at, uh, at what happened for uh, beyond, going beyond the Gaussian process infinite width limit. And we have a theory that kind of um, gives a set of equations that track what, what will be, predict what will be the output of the network um, for, for finite width. Um, I, don't, I don't know what is the equivalent there for, for learning rate, so that you cannot really mm -hmm. do using uh, this type of um, um, a theory. Um, I mean, you can think about it in terms of Langevin uh, dynamics and, and then think about learning, the learning rate, but it's not, I don't think it will be equivalent because here it's really about the discretization, the, li the discrete system of, of stochastic gradient descent, and this is extremely non-equilibrium non system compared to, um, to the Bayesian point of view. But it's, it is interesting in the sense that, um, that here I'm always working in this uh, ratio of n over d. And, and, and it's not quite clear what does it mean here to take um, t to infinity compared to, like, in the sense that maybe in the, in the, in the one pass it's, 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 it's simple because it means that if you take t to infinity, that mean, mean that you have um, infinite samples. Uh, but but from the point of view of what we would have liked to understand in, is that sometimes even if you're working with both of them going to infinity together, then it, it's, I don't know, know if I have a sense of what equilibrium mean here. So that's, and you can see that also in some of the examples there is no equilibrium. Thank you. Are there other questions? I was um, curious to know myself, uh, uh, roughly, how do you control this kind of resolvent overlaps uh, technically? What are the key tools? You mean numerically or? Uh, no, 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 the, the theorems you presented. The theorem. Okay, so, so the idea is, um, so first of all, the idea is that you, um, you kind of write it in terms of, um, this, this double decomposition, and you have these arrows that, that is like the Martingale arrow, and also some maybe this, uh, deterministic arrow that you will have. Um, and the idea of the resolvent was actually to find maybe uh, is is a way to def to define the statistics of class of function that for this one you can close the system. And so so what we find is that this type of function. Is, is essentially um, a function of this resolvent. And, if you, and, and using this type of function, you can represent anything. And if you calculate what will be the dynamics for this type of function, which is a function of this resolvent, uh, then, then you show that SGD on, these, on this set of function does converge. So this is an autonomous system. And, and I can explain it more in details later. All right, thank you very much again.